Okay guys, Timmy coming at you again and today what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you a couple of positive feedback mechanisms. Now, positive feedback mechanisms take your body away from homeostasis. Negative feedback mechanisms bring your body back to homeostasis. So in our first video on homeostatic mechanisms, I gave you three negative homeostatic mechanisms. Blood sugar control, body temperature when you're hot, and body temperature when you're cold. So now I'm going to give you two examples of positive feedback mechanisms. And the first one I want to give you is childbirth. Now, look, for women out there, homeostasis for your uterus is not to contract. But there are times when you want your uterus to contract more than it should. And that's when you're about to deliver a baby. So let me get to this. And hopefully this will make sense. Now, you got a little egg bird in here. And when egg bird's ready to deliver, he's going to drop, hopefully, his head down into the birthing canal. Now, in the cervix, the narrow part of the uterus, you have these nerves called baroreceptors. And baroreceptors respond to pressure or weight. So these baroreceptors are embedded in the muscular wall of the uterus. And when they're stimulated by pressure of Egbert's head coming down the track, those nerves, those baroreceptors, are connected to the part of your brain called the hypothalamus. And as we know, the hypothalamus is intimately involved in controlling a lot of homeostatic mechanisms. So when these baroreceptors are stimulated by pressure, they'll send an electrical impulse to the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus will begin the production of a hormone called oxytocin. Now, this is important. Any hormone that's produced by the hypothalamus is then transferred to the posterior pituitary. And it is the posterior pituitary that releases oxytocin into the blood. Now, why was oxytocin released? Well, Egbert's head is coming down the track. That means he's ready to come out. So one of the functions of oxytocin is, number one, to increase the force of contraction of the uterus. Right? It's going to make the muscular wall of the uterus contract harder. And that's what you want, right? So it's going to increase the frequency, duration, how long it contracts, and the force of contraction in an attempt to get a bird out, right? Now, once Egbert comes out, oxytocin is still present. The reason for that is oxytocin will contract the muscular wall. And when you contract the muscular wall, you're going to squish the blood vessels in the endometrial lining. And that prevents the woman from essentially bleeding out when the placenta is delivered. And you also have to deliver the placenta, too. So oxytocin's effects are pretty prolonged. The second thing that oxytocin does is it will um, stimulate milk production in the breast. Right? So Egbert's out. Now you got to feed him. Or her. The other thing that oxytocin does 
And this is really important. Oxytocin increases the bonding of uh, mom to baby. That's why when a baby's delivered, they want to clean him up real quick, put some silver nitrate in his eyes, do a quick APGAR, APGAR score, and then swaddle the kid and put him into the mother's arms as soon as possible because that's the highest level of oxytocin. And oxytocin affects the limbic system of the brain or the emotional portion of the brain, and it will increase the bonding of mother to child. They're also using oxytocin as um, uh, for fathers, they're giving it nasally during um, delivery so that the, the father bind, uh, bonds to the child as well. So, and again, that's a positive feedback mechanism. So, let's review. As Egbert's head's coming down the track, it's going to put pressure on the muscular wall of the cervix. There's barrel receptors in the cervix, right? They're going to signal the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is going to begin the production of oxytocin. Oxytocin is then transported to the posterior pituitary and then secreted into the blood. And the functions of oxytocin are to increase the frequency, duration, and force of contraction of the uterus to get Egbert out. Once Egbert does come out, oxytocin stimulates milk production and Number three, oxytocin increases the bonding of mother to child. So that's a positive feedback mechanism. Now, the next one to me is even more important. Now, you learned in general that the autonomic nervous system, which is part of the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, is further subdivided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is also referred to as the fight or flight response, right? And it's really important. And the, the reason it's really important, because clinically, um, many drugs work to either stimulate the sympathetic nervous system or to block it. So beta blockers block the effect of the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine. And those drugs are pretty fundamental. Now, the singular purpose of the sympathetic nervous system is this. It's to prepare your body to run or fight. So it's not normal to be scared all the time, but when you are scared, there's a reason that you do get scared. And again, it's to prepare your body to run or fight. So let's look at this. First of all, let's look at the arrangement of the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, and this is important, and I, I'm not going to explain it now, but it's really important uh, clinically when somebody has a spinal cord injury. The sympathetic nervous system, the spinal nerves, exit the spinal cord in kind of the middle of the spinal cord. And then as you can see, as these spinal nerves exit, they get connected together in what's called the sympath uh, sympathetic ganglia. And what's important about that and the reason for that is this. If you get scared, you know, you see a big spider, right? That's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. And when you activate the sympathetic nervous system, you activate all of it, right? You could never use the excuse, Tim, I can't study for class because my liver's scared, right? When you get scared, you get scared all over. And the singular purpose for getting scared, again, is to prepare your body to run or fight. So let's look at some of the changes that occur under sympathetic stimulation. And what I really want you to understand is why these changes occur. So let's say you get scared and you've activated the sympathetic nervous system. Well, one of the fundamental changes that are going to happen is your pupils are going to dilate, right? 
Now, why would you want your pupils to dilate? Well, let's think about this, right? When are you more likely to be scared? In a nice, well-lit, sunny park with all your friends around? Or in a dark alley where you're all by yourself and you hear the words, I'm going to kill you, right? So the reason your pupils dilate under sympathetic stimulation is to allow more light to get in. And the more light that gets into the retina, the better you can see. Now, it's going to inhibit the production of saliva. What do you need saliva for? You need saliva to eat. You ain't going to be worried about finishing your dinner if somebody's trying to attack you, right? So your mouth dries up. That's why when you take speech class and you have to give your speech in front of all those people, you, you know, your mouth and your lips smack because your mouth is all dry. Now, with respect to the cardiovascular system, right? The sympathetic nervous system is going to increase your heart rate, and it's going to increase the force of contraction of the heart, right? The heart's going to start pounding away, and that increase in the force of contraction is going to increase your blood pressure. Now, why do you want that to happen? Well, what happens to your heart rate and blood pressure when you're running or fighting for your life? Well, the answer is it goes up. So, Basically, what the sympathetic nervous system does is it primes, primps, primps, okay. It primes the pump. It primes your cardiovascular system to get ready to run or fight. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to take all of your arteries throughout your body and it's going to constrict them. That too causes your blood pressure to go up. And it also prevents nice oxygenated arterial blood from going to parts of your body that are not needed to run or fight, right? And again, the body does stuff that makes sense. The next thing it's gonna do is dilate the bronchioles of your lungs. Now look, why do you want that to happen? Well, when you're running or fighting, you're gonna have to get more air in and remove more carbon dioxide. So dilating the bronchioles is preparing the lungs to take in more oxygen and remove more CO2. Now, on a clinical note, look, if anyone's out there has got asthma, when you suck on that albuterol a couple of times, right, it dilates your bronchioles. But if you take enough of it, it's going to have some systemic effects, right? So you feel agitated, you feel jittery, right? Your heart's racing. That's because albuterol mimics the sympathetic nervous system. It also inhibits peristalsis, right? Again, look, GI activity you don't need when you're running or fighting for your life. Also, when people are in the hospital, they're sick. You should write that down. Now look, if you're sick, your body's stressed. And when you're stressed, your sympathetic nervous system is activated. And that slows down your... GI activity. That's why on the medication list, the last medication listed is usually a stool softener because physicians know that these people are going to be constipated. The other thing is, is that it elevates, sympathetic nervous system elevates your blood sugar. Now, why do you want that to happen? Well, the only fuel the brain can use to make energy is glucose. So you know how you feel when you're hungry and your blood sugar is low, cranky, kind of tired? You don't want to be cranky and tired, maybe cranky, but certainly not tired when you're running or fighting for your life. And this is also important, too, when someone is sick. Now, if they're a type 1 diabetic where they have to take insulin every day, now this is really important, regardless of whether or not they're taking any food in, if a type 1 diabetic, a person who has to take insulin, every day. If they're sick, the sympathetic nervous system is going to be stimulated. And that means their blood sugar is going to go up. So type 1 diabetics, type 1 diabetics that have to take insulin on sick days, they have to take more insulin. And they love talking about that in clinical. Right? So that's very important to remember. The other thing is the sympathetic nervous system 
directly innervates the inner portion of the adrenal gland or the medulla of the adrenal gland. And it causes the release into the blood of the hormone epinephrine. Now I'm gonna say this real slow. Hormones take longer to act, but they act longer. So epinephrine augments or it hypes up the sympathetic response. It makes it bigger, makes it last longer. Let me give you an example. Watch. You're at home reading your textbook. All right. So this is this is a makeup example. I'm making this up. And you think somebody's in your house, right? You hear the door open or something. Sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, right? You get scared. You go out there to investigate. And you realize the wind blew the door open. So nobody's there. Now, intellectually, you know the threat is gone, right? So you can turn off your sympathetic nervous system. The problem is, is that you can't go back to reading the textbook. Why? Because you're still nervous, shaky, your heart rate, it feels like your heart's going to pound out of your chest, right? That's the effects of epinephrine. So epinephrine takes longer to act, but it acts longer. Now, a couple of other things with the sympathetic nervous system. And we, we're going to learn this, but you gotta hear it more than once, okay? You got the blood and you got a cell. And we're gonna call this a heart cell, right? Now, what does the heart do? The heart's made of muscle and it contracts and relaxes, right? Now, you got the sympathetic nervous system stimulated, and you also have epinephrine. But in order for epinephrine to produce its effect on the heart, make your heart rate go up and blood pressure go up, make the heart contract harder, it has to bind to a receptor that's specific for epinephrine. That receptor is called a beta-1 receptor. And beta-1 receptors are found in the heart. So when epinephrine binds to a beta-1 receptor, it's going to cause an increase in heart rate and an increase in blood pressure. Now, there are people out there who are real smart, a lot smarter than I am. And a long time ago, they came up with the idea that if you can make a medicine that blocks beta receptors in the heart, that means epinephrine can't bind there. And if epinephrine can't bind there, then that's going to cause a drop in your heart rate and a drop in your blood pressure. And there are drugs out there called, you're not going to believe this, beta blockers. And beta blockers function by preventing epinephrine from binding to beta receptors in the heart. And therefore, they lower your heart rate and blood pressure. The other thing I wanted to mention is, when are you more likely to bleed when you're sleeping or when you're running or fighting for your life. So you should have probably learned this in general. One of the functions of the liver is to make blood clotting factors. So what do you think the sympathetic nervous system does to your liver? right? You're right. The sympathetic nervous system will increase the production of blood clotting factors by the liver and then dump them into the blood. Now, I'm a nurse and I worked in an ER. 
and people would come in with like amputated limbs and you would expect blood to be spurtulating everywhere. But in fact, it wasn't. And one of the responses is, again, with the sympathetic nervous system is arteries will constrict, right? So if the arteries constricted, then less blood flow is going to go there and the liver increases the blood clotting factors so you can form a blood clot quicker so you don't bleed to death. Now, those are the functions of the sympathetic nervous system. And again, because it's not normal to be scared all the time, the sympathetic nervous system takes you away from homeostasis. So the sympathetic nervous system and its activation is an example of a positive feedback mechanism. So I hope that helped. And again, when I'm testing you on this stuff, it's not going to be a simple, okay, the sympathetic nervous system prepares your body to run or fight. This is, this is the advanced class. And when you get into clinical, they're going to be expecting you to know this stuff. So I'm going to be asking you about specific effects of the sympathetic nervous system and why it makes sense. So you really need to understand each aspect that I explained about the pupils dilating, saliva, increased heart rate, all that stuff. Okay, good, I hope it helped and I'll see you in class.